Amen. Let's, let's lift our hands to the Lord. Father, we do come before you in the name of Jesus. We certainly thank you for this awesome meeting. Thank you, Lord, for this, this, this gathering of leaders and, and people who are, are turning the world upside down. Praise God for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing that's in this house and upon me and these lips of clay that I speak forth your word with excellence, accuracy, and boldness. Father, I ask you to think through my mind and speak through my lips, and this word will come forth unhindered, unchecked by any outside force. Now we give you the praise in advance for not only the revelation, but the signs, wonders, and miracles that are confirming the word preached. We give you praise and honor you with it in Jesus' name. Can somebody shout amen? Glory to God. Flow, flow. I'm going to come down here where the people are. Come down here where the fire is. Amen. Well, first of all, let's give a hand clap to Brother and Sister Copeland for just being faithful in this thing and carrying us this far. All right, let's open your Bibles, please, because I want to start on time and stop on time. <laughs> Praise God. All right, amen. I'm going to talk to you, and it could be both sessions that I'm going to do, and uh, <clears throat> talk to you about a subject that... <sighs> It, it's an outgrowth of something that God gave me, gave me a teaching on the wealth transfer. And, uh, <clears throat> but I heard this in my heart and I since then heard Jesse, uh, Brother Jesse talk about it. And, um, and so I, I adopted that part of that title. And uh, so I'm going to call it Taking Ownership Part 2. Taking Ownership Part 2. Now, I think you really, or I know you're really going to be blessed by this. This is something that the Holy Ghost gave me. Glory to God. Now, I'm going to take my time, but I'm going to finish on time. So let's just be cool. And just receive the word of God. Let's go over to Psalms chapter 115. Psalm chapter 115. Now he says this in verse 16. Must be Brother Max folks over there. Praise God. Amen. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Yes. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. <clears throat> now, I've been teaching a lot on the kingdom of God. Because as I went through the Bible and began to track and what my calling is, I began to see how Jesus was teaching on the kingdom and how this kingdom differed a little bit from the gospel that I had been traditionally raised on. And that was uh, the gospel of salvation. And that's good because we got to get souls saved into the kingdom and so forth. But then after you get them saved, what? What's next? And I saw that God had a bigger target than just getting them saved. But he had them to be saved and for the person to be transformed. 
and for them to be agents of change wherever he would send them. And that would affect, preserve the earth. That would, of course, uh, continue the mandate that he gave to Adam to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. So it, I began to start preaching on the kingdom. And I saw when I preached on the kingdom, the kingdom opens up additional amounts to me of revelation. It's, it's not so much a, about the futuristic gospel of us going to heaven, but it's more about heaven coming to earth. And as I, one day I was getting in my car, this happened fairly recently. And I was getting in my car and I was looking, getting something out of the glove compartment. I was sitting, the car was still. And I leaned over to get it and I looked up at my video display and it had disappeared. Then I got back in my seat and I could see everything clearly. Then I leaned back over again and it disappeared again. And so I saw that it depends on where you're looking from as to what you can see. And I think when people are not looking from a kingdom perspective, there are certain things that are obscure to them. And so when I'm coming now, I'm preaching from a kingdom perspective. Now, I'm, we're going to hopefully in these two sessions get you there, praise God. But I just saw that when I, when I do that, there's a lot of things open up for me. And I began to see things, I believe, like um, God wanted me to see them and so forth and so on. Now, I'm not saying other people are not seeing things. But I'm just seeing here that <clears throat> this church is powerful. I mean, it is the most powerful institution in the world ever. Amen. The Bible says when we leave here, he said there's nothing that was like the church before we came. And after we leave, there'll be nothing like it. It is that powerful. It is, you know, they talk about separation of church and state. Well, the truth is, if there was no church, there wouldn't be any state. The church is just that powerful. I mean, when, when God created Adam, I mean, Satan stepped back and said, what is that? Because this man that he created was so powerful and well, let's, let's get into this thing here. Praise God. So he says, the heavens, even the heaven of the Lord, but the earth has he given to the children of men. So let's go back to Genesis chapter one. Let's go back to the beginning and just see what he says here. Now in Genesis chapter one, in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I like what, who is that? Brother Cap said, we have dominion over creeps. <laughs> Praise God. I like that. Because I know some. Okay, now in this, <clears throat> in this, now let me, let, me let me stay holy now. All right, praise the Lord. But he says, and God said, let us make man in the image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Let them have, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Now, as I look at this, let, let, me, let me demonstrate this. Sir, if you would come for just a moment, please. Yes, sir. I'm just playing now. Okay. All right. Now. You hear from God. I'm gonna, yeah, right, right, right. I'll hear from God, yeah. Get my watch back. But he, in, in this, I've got a watch. Belongs to me. Okay, suppose I give it. Okay, let them. All right, now, who has... <laughs> Lock the door. Uh, <laughs> but 
All right? Now, so he has it. But who has the watch? He does. Who does not have the watch? I do not. I gave it to him. Now, next week, I'm going to a dinner. This is all play-like. And going to a dinner. So now, going to that dinner, oh, I'd like to use that watch. I'd like to wear that watch. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to go to him and what? Get, ask his permission. And he has to agree to it. And then I can have the watch. Am I right about it? Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Can you get it? You can't get it up. <laughs> Shonda. Okay. Now, now you see why he said in Matthew chapter 9, he said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into his harvest. Well, if God's running it, why doesn't he send laborers the way he wants to anytime he wants to? Because he can't, because of the rules that he set up. Let them have dominion. So I'm, I'm only saying that to say that for God to get in the earth to do what God has already done or planned to do, then he needs saints, he needs the people of God to give him permission. Can you say amen? amen? Now, the reason why I want to show you that, because that is basically where I'm coming from here. We're going to talk about some things, but you got to keep that in mind. That's a kingdom perspective. We know God is the ruler of everything, but God is not running the world. The church should be running the world, and God is running the church. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. And a lot of times what we're doing is we're waiting on God to move. And when you have a press session, not many people be there. When you have a bless me session, everybody's there. Right. My point to you is you need to come to the press session so you can get blessed. Amen. Amen. I'm saying God has got us here with dominion. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. All right, let's keep rolling. All right, then he says in verse 28, he said, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So now let's examine some words here. Now I'm not going to go into bless because perhaps Brother Copeland may be preaching on that. But you know, the blessing of Abraham and the Eden blessing and so forth like that. Everywhere Adam went, he was supposed to create a garden. To get, I mean, the garden is supposed to expand. All right, let's just look at this. Now, what does dominion mean? All right, glory to God. Woo, Holy Ghost won't have to help me now. Because this is, this is a powerful, powerful concept. It means rulership. It means lordship. Okay, rulership. He says in Psalm chapter 103 and verse 19, his kingdom rules over all. Lordship having to do with authority. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the, all, the, all the power of the enemy. It means caretakership, or another word would be stewardship. Um, you've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you rule over much. But the last one I'd like to acquaint you with is the idea of ownership. Now, when I went into the dictionary, that's Webster's Dictionary, and that's Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Trusted you're acquainted with it. He said, he gives a word, and then he gives a scripture of where that word is used. He said, he defined it like this, sovereign or supreme authority. 
This is dominion now. Power to govern or to control. It also means power to direct, control, use, or dispose of at pleasure. The word dominion. Now it means ownership. Now if it means ownership, of which it does, let's understand what owner means. To own. I got this out of the Webster 1828 dictionary. To have legal or rightful title to. To have legal or rightful title to. All right? So I go somewhere and I start preaching. And I ask a question of the congregation. I say, how many of you own your own homes? Don't put your hand up. I'm just saying what I do. And all these hands go up. How many of you own your own cars? All these hands go up. All right, let me read the definition of own again. To have legal or rightful title to. Got it? Now, when the mortgage crisis hit back in 2010, all of a sudden we saw who owned and who didn't. It's amazing how many houses went back to the bank, how many houses went back to the mortgage company, the finance companies, even cars. Why? Didn't own it. Now that's just like the devil. Come on now. Because I, I, I've seen stores, they said, hey, the, the, I'm a, it's, it's a loan store and it said, bring me a title and you can get a loan. Seems like the devil wants ownership. Well, I got news for you. Jesus didn't die for payments. He died for ownership. Now I'm saying we know that he, he's a redeemer and so forth and he died to bring our lives back to God, back to the Father. But I'm just letting you know I'm not that we're not talking against mortgage payment, but I'm telling you that there's an ownership here that God wants you to have that the enemy may not want you to have. Say amen. amen. When you have a mentality of ownership, you think different. And the enemy knows it. You, I, when I say enemy, I mean the devil. <laughs> he knows you think different. When, I, when you own an apartment building, let's say you own an apartment building with eight units in it, and it's close to a university, and some students are renting some of them. Now, nothing against students, but how many of you know you got to go check on your property every now and then. Why? Because they don't own it. Is this the right bunch I'm talking to now? So what am I saying? I'm saying I remember when I was a young boy, about the second grade. Remember when I was about to go out to class that morning? Put on my pants, my little jeans. My mother was looking at me. She said, no, 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 baby, pull those jeans off. Take those underwear off. Let mommy give you some more underwear. I said, why, mama? She said, because those have a hole in it, baby. I said, oh, mama, that's all right. And pull my little jean up. Get those jeans off. I'm, let me give you some more underwear. Notice. So I took the jeans off, put some more underwear on, pulled my jeans up. I'm pouting about it, you know, I want my own way. And uh, <clears throat> I said, Mama, why did I have to change my underwear? I have my jeans on, nobody can see it. She said, yeah, baby, but something might happen to you out there today. <laughs> now, I'm not saying something was gonna happen, but something might happen to you out there today. 
And then, because I was brought up in a small town in Tuskegee, Alabama, she said, they take you and take you over to Johnny Andrew Hospital, which is the only hospital in town we go to, and, and they'd pull your pants down and see the holes in your underwear and say, oh my Lord, this is Miss Winston's child. <laughs> Now, I want you to, I, I know we're laughing about this, I want you to get this. She was taking ownership over her child. She was taking ownership over her reputation. Say amen to this. You see, <clears throat> When there's no ownership, there's no outrage. I'm going to show you where you own this earth. And I'm going to show you when you know you own it. The devil can't come in and make ungodly laws in it. You won't stand for it. But when you're just passing through, trying to make heaven my home, when we all get to heaven. I don't know whether you know it or not, but you're as much in heaven now as you are on earth. You are seated together with him in heavenly places. This is what the kingdom will do. It'll give you a revelation so that you can have a revolution. And I'm not talking about hurting anybody or anything like that. I'm talking about taking back what belongs to you. No, no, no. Nothing just can't go on. Because I own it. Let me give you another example. How about time somebody's going to get a rental car. Yeah, take this rental car and drive it for about three or four days. Now they're going to take it back. But the gas needle is just about on E. And take it back. And they see the gas needle and say, well, let me fill it up. Because when I get there, if they fill it up, they're going to add some charges onto it, you know. So they stop by the gas station, the filling station, to fill it up. And he opened up the, the receptacle thing and says, please put premium gas only. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> and the difference between premium and regular is a dollar ten. Now I know this is nobody in this bunch. I, I know I, I know this is nobody in this bunch. <laughs> but what people do. They'll squeeze off regular in there because they don't own it. When you don't own stuff, the enemy can tell it. He can tell it because ownership brings an outrage that you will not let the devil run over your stuff. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So what am I saying? Adam, you have dominion. Well, what happened? Chapter two, he gave of Genesis, he gave him a prohibition. He said, don't eat of that tree. Chapter three, Eve checks the tree out, looks at it, good for food, to make one wise. She eats of it and gave it to Adam who was with her. He wasn't down there at Kmart. He was with her and he ate. And notice what happened. Everything fell. Everything fell. They didn't even know their father anymore because now they had switched fathers. Yes. Yep. Yes, sir. It was a royal mess. The Bible says the power that was flowing through him now got perverted and now it's no longer, it's the curse and that curse is spreading out everywhere. And, and even, I heard Brother Copeland preach, and I said it before, even uh, when Jesus died, he had to take the blood and cleanse the heavenly utensils. That's how much authority this one man had. That's why the Bible says in Psalm chapter 8, what is man? 
that thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man that thou visitest him. Thou hast made him a little lower than angels, than God. So, the message translation in that, by the way, says, man barely miss being God, or something like that. A little lower than God. He made him in his own image. He duplicated himself. And then blessed him. Gave him the power to run this earth. So what am I saying? <clears throat> I'm saying because Adam failed to take title, Satan took it. And now he's got it. Let's go over to Luke chapter 4, please. Luke chapter 4. Y'all with me so far? Now I got some good news for you, so just... Don't leave till I sew you up, as Brother Copeland says. Are you with me? Luke chapter 4, and look at verse 5. And the devil taking them up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this power will I give you in the glory of them, for they have been delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. That was a temptation. If thou will worship me, all shall be thine. Now, what I want to show you this is just a couple of things. One, <clears throat> the power is not in the system. The power is in the one who is over the system. We got to bind a strong man. Okay. So now notice what he's doing. And look at these things that it says here. Look at verse 5 again. He says he, the, the devil taking them up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time. Notice kingdoms in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this power, underline it, will I give you and the glory. That sounds familiar. The kingdom, the power and the glory. See what Satan was doing, he was trying to make Adam in his image. All of mankind. Still trying to do it. The biggest thing he was after was that seed. But anyway, so here's the devil. Now he's got jurisdiction over this thing. Over in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says, it, I'm paraphrasing now, it was better not to be born during that time. Why? Because the power was on the wrong side. He was on the side of the devil. He was running this, folks. He was setting up kingdoms all over the place. All right. Thank God for a redeemer. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right, so... Let's look here in getting this thing back because we are to reclaim everything that Jesus redeemed. Let's go back to Genesis in chapter 13, please. Genesis chapter 13. Now, as you know, God chose a man named Abraham. Well, his name was Abram at that time. Okay. And so God is now going to take this man. He's blessing him. And now he's going to have it so that this man will be the beginning of a new line of wealth. And that as he is taking this man, he got him, said, let me bless you and make your name great. You'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. And these shall all families of the earth be blessed. So no, notice what God is doing now. He's trying to get the blessing back to everybody again, just like Adam was supposed to do. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 13. And here is where Lot, and he was, you know, Lot was following Abraham. He was a lot of problems. He was, he was busy following Abraham. And uh, <clears throat> Lot now, and there, there's, Abraham is getting very rich, and he's rich in cattle, silver, and gold. And Lot got rich in flocks, herds, and sheep, because whenever you the blessed one, you get the pedigree. So as we go on down, we look here 
and see in verse 7, and there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled in the land. Now, this is interesting. Herdmen. That word herdmen in the Hebrew is R-A-H, Raha. Having to do, if you translate it, it means pastors. So the pastors had some strife. Uh -oh. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I just thought you'd be interested to know that. Amen. <laughs> but notice, the land couldn't bear them. They were getting so blessed. So everything was increasing. To the point that Abram said this. He said, let there be no strife between us. If you want to take the right hand, I'll take the left. If you take the left hand, I'll take the right. Now, how could he say that? and be at peace with it because he had the blessing. And wherever he went, he could turn it into a garden. Didn't make any difference. He could go to the worst place on the earth. It didn't make any difference. And that same blessing is on you, by the way. Hey, praise God. All right, glory to God. But here's the deal. Hey, Lot chose the well-watered land. And sometimes we do that because sometimes Christians are looking to go places that they don't have to use one ounce of faith. And I heard Brother Copeland preaches years ago that for you to be in a place that you don't have to use any faith is the most dangerous place you can be in. Because your faith will atrophy. It'll get weak. It'll get it'll lazy and so forth and so on. All of a sudden, here comes something, emergency, and you <coughs> coughing, out of shape, so forth and so on. You need to keep your faith at work. Praise God on something. All right. But anyway, so let's go all the way down to verse 14. And in verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. All right, a couple of things here. Number one, until you can see it, you're not entitled to possess it. Until you can see it, you're not entitled to possess it. Now, I understand people were living on that. Now, I'm not talking about stealing. I'm talking about repossession. Because it doesn't belong to Satan or his family. It belongs to God and his family. Say amen to that. Revelation uh, or seeing is the greatest asset to the school of faith. Revelation is. You're designed to believe what you see. Now here's the key. You don't see with your eyes, you see through them. Amen. You see with your mind. Your eyes are windows, the image comes in, goes on your mind. You can see the same thing I see and, and say something different. And the reason why is because how your mind interpreted it. So Satan doesn't come to blind your eyes, he comes to blind your mind. Because he knows that once you see it, your faith is locked. Once you see it, you become bold as a six-shooter. You'll speak it. You'll walk it. Believing is seeing. Mm. Yep. But when you believe something, it affects your whole attitude. It affects your, your behavior when you believe it. But you see it. It was time for me to leave the company that I was working with, IBM, and go into full-time ministry. And every time I went to make a step, I'd set a date, 
of when I was going to leave and the dates start coming up and the voice starts speaking to me. Baby, need a new pair of shoes. <laughs> House notice due. I'd set another date. But then I got a hold of a tape series that came out with a guy that you might know named Brother Jerry Savelle. And he came out with a teaching on seed time and harvest. And I got that teaching and a verse popped out at me. Mark chapter 10 verses 29 and 30. There is no man that has left house or mother or father, sister, brother or land or job for my sake, but he shall receive a hundredfold now. You got what I'm saying? See, when I was stepping out, I couldn't see. And you're not designed to go where you can't see. Folks, when you can see something other folk can't see, you can go somewhere other people can't go. Watch it. You can have something other people can't have. Watch it. You can do something other people can't do. But what happened? All of a sudden, I meditated it. Now, meditation, I put the definition down here because sometimes we need to know what words mean. Glory to God. Meditation is a God-given process that produces a spiritual experience that causes a permanent change in your thinking. Meditation. A God-given process that produces a spiritual experience that causes a permanent change in your thinking. What did, what did Joseph do? He had a dream, didn't he? Had that dream again, didn't he? He was never the same. He was talking something that they'd never heard before. They said, who do you think you are? How about the apostle Paul? Notice what he was. No, Peter, when Peter was asleep on the housetop, all of a sudden a sheep came down from heaven. And he had a spiritual experience of all these four-legged beasts. He, and something said, arise, Peter, kill and eat. He said, I've never eaten anything unclean. He said, what I call unclean, what I call clean, don't you call unclean. And next thing you know, he went into the house of a, of a Gentile. That was unheard of. Notice, you can go somewhere you've never been before. If you can just see it. That enemy messes with the mind to try to keep you seeing your car running out of gas or keep you seeing the, the bill collected, the door, you know, imagining thing instead of keeping you seeing a pot of gold coming to your house or uh, you, you know what I'm saying? So what am I saying? Abraham, as far as you can see. So I meditate that scripture all of a sudden on Saint, in St. Paul, Minnesota, that thing exploded inside of me. And once it did, I called my wife. I said, baby, I'm leaving this company. Let me introduce you to my wife. This is after 30 years, praise God. Sister Veronica, stand up so they can see you. Glory to God. Amen. She said, well, praise the Lord. Now I went in and told my boss, I said, John, I'm leaving the company. He jumped up, closed the door. Bill, what's wrong? I said, nothing wrong. I just, I just got a call on my life. He said, you got a what? I said, I have a call on my life. Bill, take two weeks off. Just like that. Boom. Just two weeks off. Well, when I took two weeks off, I meditated it some more. <laughs> and the clearer the picture, the faster the acceleration towards your known goal. The clearer the picture. People can't hardly get that because they can't hardly see it. So what am I saying? Abraham. As far as you can see, I'm going to give it to you. So what am I saying to you? In this Bible, there's a lot of promises. And you can take these promises and meditate them according to what needs you have. Get that revelation in your mind. All of a sudden, your believing comes in place. And let me tell you, you are on your way. Let's go down to verse 17. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, glory to God, for I will give it unto you. Now, this is kind of interesting. Here's what I want to say about it. Your feet will never take you where your mind has never been. My, my, my. 
Renewing the mind has a lot to do with what you can do for God and what you can receive from God. Renewing of that mind. Okay? So, here is Abraham. Now, God is using him. But as I go on through here, glory to God. I want to look at how God had to renew the minds of his people so that they could receive what he had. Turn with me, please, to Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Now, say ownership. My, Lord have mercy, my objective is to not only give you the word concerning ownership, but to give you the faith concerning ownership so that you can receive what God has already given to you. Say amen to that. Amen. All right. Now I got some stuff for you. Now I told you, let me take my time. Didn't I tell you that before we started? All right, this is the story of the prodigal son. Now, the prodigal son is kind of an interesting thing. Because he said, Dad, give me my inheritance, I'm out of here. So he got it. Now, this is the Winston translation. And so he got it, and he left. Now, after he left, he spent all that he had, didn't have anything, and nobody gave to him. So now he says, I'm going to join myself to citizen of this country. He was living now much below his own, where he should be living. And they gave him a job feeding hogs. In other words, living on leftovers. So now, here he goes on down. <laughs> here he goes on down. Verse 17. And he came to himself and said, how many hired servants in my father's have bread enough to spare? And I'm perishing with hunger. Watch this. I'll arise and go to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Let me ask you a question. Was he a servant or was he a son? son. Verse 19. Verse eight, uh, 20, pardon me. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a long ways off, his father saw him and he had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. I'm now more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Notice he didn't say bring the one on sale, but that's all right. And put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither a fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead. He's alive again. He's lost and he's found. And they began to be what? Merry. Now the elder son was in the field. Now notice what happened. This son went, spent everything, came back, father gave him everything. I understand he repented and came into the father's house. But notice what he was trying to do at first. He's saying, make me as a servant. Now he wasn't a servant, he was a son. Because a servant has to work for everything he gets. A son gets by inheritance. Now I want you to get this now. I'm not trying to create somebody to be lazy. What I'm telling you is you can't work for anything that comes out of heaven. You've got to receive it. Say amen to that. Now, if this, oh Jesus, can I jump ahead and just say something? If this whole earth belongs to us, why would I pay for it? Now, I'm going to ask the question again. If this, I'm going to show you scriptures where it belongs to you. It belongs from the surface to the core. It belongs to you. And if you don't take ownership, there is somebody that will. And he's been taking ownership. He's been making ungodly laws. He's been creating pockets of poverty. He's been creating all kinds of stuff because the saints are just singing praising, going about, talking about faith, singing about faith, loving faith, but never doing anything but faith. And I'm telling you, enough is enough. It's time for us to mobilize. Can't just sit here and let this stuff 
happen to let this thing run all over. It's not the people. Don't look at the people. The people are not the problem, but I guarantee you they're not the problem. The people, the Bible says we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. I don't care how they look, what they sound like. They're not the problem. The problem is the evil one. He's running them and they don't even know it. He has put up somebody that's most conducive to doing what he said. And what we got to do is bind the strong man and we will then spoil his house. Man, I'm preaching good. That stuff belongs to us is in the wrong hands and God wants it out. We got work to do and it's going to take the resources of the earth to get it done. Say amen to that. Whew. All right, where was I? Praise God. So the eldest son was in the field and while he was in the field, he came in and heard music and dancing and so forth. He said, what's going on in this? Well, his young, younger brother, he was, he was gone and now he's come back and the father has received him safe and sound and given a celebration. He said, what? Now this is Winston. <laughs> what? <laughs> Look what happened. Let's go on down here and let's go down near verse, verse 29. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, all these many years I've served you, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandments, and yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. And as soon as this trifling, no good, <laughs> that, that Winston, that's Winston, I'm putting Winston in there. <laughs> but as soon as this thy son has come, which has devoured harlot, uh, uh, thy living with harlots, you kill a fatted calf him, and he said to him, son, thou art ever with me. And what? All that I have is thine. All that God has is yours. How much does God have? Every, everything. Everything. Now, don't go by what the world system has taught you. Because they don't know. <laughs> they don't, you've got to let God be true and every man be a liar. Amen. Well, let's keep going. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. How are we doing? Y'all still, everybody still okay? Praise God. All right, Galatians chapter 4. All right, look what he said in verse 1. Now I say that the heir as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now let me read that out of the Amplified. <clears throat> Praise God. Let me see. Somebody over here. Do you have an Amplified translation? Oh, right. Okay, come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> no, come up here. G give me the Amplified Bible. <laughs> All right. This is Amplified Translation. Now, what I mean is this, that as long as the inheritor, the heir, is a child and underage, he does not differ from a slave, although he's the master of all the estate. I'll read it one more time. Now, what I mean is this, as long as the inheritor, the heir, is a child and underage, he does not differ from a slave, although he's the master of all the estate. Are you following what I'm saying here? Thank you, sir. I'll put $100 in here for you. And just, it pays to have the word of God. This is your year. Did anybody else have an amplified over here? Okay. <laughs> I know, yeah, right. <laughs> See, when you're broke, you can't do that. Hey, Amen. No, I just kidding. I just kidding. Now, watch this. There is an inheritance for you that cannot be delivered to you beyond your level of growth. 
There is an inheritance for you that cannot be delivered to you beyond your level of growth. Many times people in the church have been carnal. For you to go into Canaan and face those giants, you're going to have to be spiritual. You're going to have to stop arguing with your cousin. You, come on, you're going to have to stop being drawn in to all this stuff that is on a low level. Say amen to that. But the inheritance is there. See, the two sons, both of them are supposed to get it. But one couldn't. Oh, it's out there. You remember that story of the piranha fish? And how that piranha fish has, uh, a piranha, as you know, is a very violent fish. I mean, he, he, you put your hand in a piranha tank, they attack that thing and eat the meat off in seconds. But they had a piranha tank and they had some small fish. And what they did is when the, when the piranha, one piranha fish got hungry, he just eat the small fish. Well, they put a plastic divider between the piranha and the small, small fish. Now, piranha gets hung, hungry. But as he goes after the fish, what does he do? He hits that divider. And they left it that way for 30 days. After 30 days, they took the divider out. What do you think the piranha did? Did he eat the fish? No, no. Because in his mind, he couldn't see any way to get to them. That's called the memory of an elephant. So what am I telling you? <clears throat> I'm telling you that Jesus removed the divider out of your life. And the provisions are swimming all around you. You probably come across an opportunity to make a million dollars probably once a day. You can't see. People are not poor because they don't have money. They're poor because they don't have knowledge. So let's keep going. Can we keep going here? All right. Now let's go over to, see where I am here. I just got my scriptures down. Hebrews chapter one. Let me take me check my timekeeper here and see what kind of time I got. Pray the Lord, pray the Lord. Brother Copeland's after me, so I gotta get. Yeah, I gotta get. Oh, you. Uh, ten, oh man. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm getting nervous now. But pray the Lord. No, no I just kidding. Ain't no nervous in here. Praise God. Uh, what did I tell you? He was chapter one. Okay. Say ownership. Say it three times. Ownership, ownership, ownership. All right. Hebrews chapter one, verse one. God who had sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers, fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. He has appointed heir of how many things? All things. Jesus the Bible says in Charles B. Williams' translation is the lawful owner of everything. Jesus is the lawful owner of everything. Well, that is, that is Jesus, Pastor. What does that have to do with us? Turn to Romans chapter 8 then. Look at Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, look what he says in verse 11. Um, uh, pardon me, not verse 11, verse 16. <laughs> the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Say, I'm a child of God. <laughs> and if children, then what? Heirs. Keep going. Heirs of God. Keep going. 
and join heirs with Christ. So wait, 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 join heirs, not sub heirs, join heirs, not 50 50, 100 100. Whatever he gets, come on, I get. Say amen. amen. So this is very interesting. Now let's go a step further because we got to see how do we take delivery. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. How am I doing so far? Am I doing okay? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11, 11. Look what he says here in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse one. Now faith is the substance of things, come on, hope for the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> right over here, I need an amplified, right up in here. Okay, right there, you came up first. Come on, come on, come on. See, y'all know it pays to have the word of God. Now it pays, man. It, it pays big money to have the word of God. Glory to God. Amen. And remember what we said. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Didn't we say that? All right. Okay. All right. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Notice what faith is. It is the assurance. It is the confirmation and the title deed. I said faith is the title deed. Thank you, sir. Here's a hundred dollars. You made it. Praise God. Bless. Bless. Now, can I have one more? Air? No, that's all. That's all. I'll wait. Wait till next. I even get it out of my mouth now. Notice, faith is a title deed. See, for God to evict Satan, he needs to see your title. Say amen to that. Oh yeah, the land belongs to you. The land is good and the land is there, but where is your title? The devil wants the title. What did I tell you? Praise God. Look what it says here. I said to you, I said that, glory to God. I said, where did I say? Amen. I said to own means to have legal or rightful title to. That's your ownership. And I got to own this. I, I'm, I, what, what, Satan cannot invade what is covered by faith. Cover your business by faith, get that title, the devil can't come in. He only could come in that garden because Adam didn't take title. Wow. I'm telling you, this year is your year for ownership. Yeah. 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 Woo, I want to say something about that. All right, let's go to one more. We just got time for one more. Praise God. Let's go. Are y'all sitting with me? <laughs> this lady, when we were starting the ministry, she burst in the office. I mean, we were in our little, we were just storefront church in Chicago, one of the, yes. in the one, a, a tough part of Chicago. And we were having, in there and having a little prayer meeting. The door, lady just burst in the door. Where's the pastor? I said, I'm the pastor. She said, uh, I need to see you. I said, what do you want, lady? She said, that, the drug dealers have taken over our block. I said, what happened? She said, 
they come out at 12 noon every day and leave at 12 midnight. They sell drugs, people coming in, suburbs, everything, to buy drugs right there on our block. The kids can't play, and the adults are terrorized. I said, lady, get in this circle. So we begin to pray. Now understand, this is kingdom. The kingdom rules over everything. So I begin to pray, and I'm looking for an answer. But I'm not looking for it from my natural mind. Because the intelligence of Egypt was not enough to stop the famine. Th that there are things that this wisdom of men cannot do. And that's why the curse is continuing to pick up. And it's getting dif more difficult. And people are getting more afraid. Because the church needs to step up. So what happened? We start praying. I downloaded. See? See? <laughs> see, God... <laughs> God intends for you. <laughs> you, your days of toiling are over. You, you, see, <laughs> see, hey, I know, I know, I know, I know that's right. See, toiling, toiling just doesn't mean I'm working hard. Toiling means even working hard mentally. See, see, here, here's the way you can tell you about the toil. Watch this. Lord, what are we going to do now? That is a toiling statement. All you got to do, if you need wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to him liberally and abradeth not. Just receive. <laughs> Just receive. And when you receive, I receive that answer. God said, get this bottle of oil and, and bless it and tell her to go pour it down the middle of her street. And, and notice I didn't cripple with it because I'm in the kingdom and there's one king and he gives commandments. I'm not trying to analyze what he's telling me because in the kingdom you don't learn, you discern. And so, boom. She, she got that bottle. She said, I said, lady, God is telling me to get you. I'm going to bless this bottle. You take it and pour it down the middle of your street. She said, okay, give it here. You see, when you're desperate, you don't ask a whole lot of questions. Some of the people of God need to get a little desperate sometimes. Stop asking so many questions. She took that oil, went up to her street, poured it down the middle of the street, came back in about five days with a big old smile on her face. She said, Pastor, guess what? I knew what. I said, what, lady? She said, they came out the next day for one hour and never came back. Since knowledge preaching makes no faith. Watch this. But faith preaching makes no sense. Ah! See, what is making sense about the gospel that comes to a lady and said, Hail Mary, you're going to have a child. Well, how is this going to happen to me? I don't even know a man. She said, well, the Holy Ghost going to come on you, and that holy thing that's going to be born of you shall be the Son of God. And that's what she said. Well, be it unto me. <laughs> say amen. N not only did she say a woman who never had a child, never had a man, going to have a baby, but he, she said, your baby is going to be God. Yeah. 
from now on, I want you to do one thing, because God is about to talk to you. Just receive. Come on, come on. Just receive. <laughs> Last scripture, I'm gone. First Corinthians <laughs> chapter three. Ah, Y'all got me preaching here. I didn't plan to preach this. Hallelujah. Verse. <laughs> I'll get you tomorrow. Praise God. Come on, give God praise. Come on, I got to quit. I got to quit. I got to quit. Come on, give God praise. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Come on, give it. Just receive. Come on. Just receive. Just receive. Woo-hoo! 